This morning we're talking about the resurrection. The Word became flesh. God walked among us as one of us. And He preached, and He taught, and He pointed people toward God, and He helped, and He healed, and He cast out demons. Uh, He did nothing but good while He was here. And for His troubles, they nailed Him to a cross. He was arrested, falsely accused, falsely convicted. Nails were put in his, His hands and feet, a crown of thorns on His head. And on that cross, Jesus died. That was on a Friday. Sunday morning, his disciples go to to treat his body. Can't find the body. They they don't know what happened to it. And the reason was that Jesus rose from the dead. Listen, folks, that tomb is empty, was empty then, and that tomb is empty today because by the power of God, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. He appeared to his disciples. He appeared to about 500 other people. Later, he appeared to the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. Jesus Christ lives today. Death could not hold him. And because Jesus rose, everything changes for us. Christians, because that tomb is empty, everything changes. And the the lives we live now have to operate on a different level the focus of our lives, the priorities of our lives, the things that we live for change because that tomb is empty. What I want to talk about this morning are gifts that you and I receive from that resurrection. Uh, It happened 2,000 years ago, but the power of it, the forward sweep of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is as impactful today as it was then, and God grants to us gifts because of it so turn to first corinthians 15 that'll be our text this morning first corinthians 15 uh this this entire chapter is 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 rich with resurrection teaching uh but paul is addressing one specific instance here and he brings some things out uh, he he well i'll get to in a minute let's just read this Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Okay, let's let's start there. Apparently, word was going around, maybe even among the church itself, that the dead were not going to be raised. When people died, they were dead, and that was it. And that seemed to be infecting the church. And Paul's saying, look, if the dead aren't raised, then even Jesus wasn't raised. And then he gives a list of the fallout consequences if that were true. So first of all, he says, verse 14, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We're even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has been, not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Here's what I want to do. He's, he's going with the consequences if Jesus had never been raised and he lists all these things off. What I'm going to do is flip those and talk about the gifts that we do receive since Jesus has been raised. Has Jesus risen from the dead? Yes or no? Yeah, absolutely. Because of that, certain things are true and these things should powerfully impact you and I. There are gifts granted by God. So let's, let's flip them. I'm not going to go in the right order. I want to start with this one first. Look in verse 17. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. If Christ was never raised, you're still in your sins. But since Jesus Christ rose from the dead, you are forgiven from your sins. You were delivered from that slavery to sin which held you in shackles and bound you tight 
and was, it was sending you straight to hell. But in Christ, you find forgiveness of your sins, and that's the thing we need. I'm starting with this because everything else flows from it. Look, look if our, we're still in our sins, then we have no hope. We have no hope for the future, and we have no hope of, of connecting to the God who loves us. Jesus took on our sins. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That means very simply this. The one who was innocent of all sin took the punishment for all sin on himself at the cross. Every single one of them, every sin you've ever committed, every sin you will commit, Jesus took that on himself. Can you imagine what that was like for him? Have you ever been falsely accused of something? And it kind of makes you mad, right? Like you get defensive. If someone is falsely accusing you of something that you never did. Well, Jesus was falsely convicted of all the sins that he never committed. He was as innocent as a baby on that cross. And yet the filth and the wrath of God fell upon him for my sin and your sin. I'll be honest. Even if it was just my sin, just me, it would have been too much. It wasn't right. But he took all of my sins and your sins and the, the, the people across the street and the people of Yukon and the people of Oklahoma and the people of the entire world. And not just that, but every sin committed from the time of Adam and Eve to the last sin committed before Jesus comes back, all that fell on him on the cross. The innocent took the punishment for the guilty so that the guilty, us, could be treated as if we were innocent in the eyes of God. Guys, that's powerful. Jesus broke the bonds by, by the most powerful act of self-sacrifice that has ever been or ever will be. You were delivered from your sins. It, it, you know, we normally associate that with the cross, and that's true. But the resurrection is the follow-through there. Turn over to, or, and I'll just read this to you, Romans 4.25, talking about Jesus who was delivered up for our trespasses, meaning he went to the cross for our sins, and he was raised because of our justification, because God cleansed us in Jesus Christ, because his blood covers us uh, and washes all that sin away in the, in the resurrection, we're justified. Our sins are gone. They're handled. They're taken care of. Let me read this to you. This means that by his death, he paid the penalty for our sins and purchased our acquittal, our justification, our forgiveness. Since the achievement of the cross was so complete, the work of our justification so decisive, God raised Jesus from the dead to validate our forgiveness, to vindicate his son's righteousness, and to celebrate that work of justification. Because of all that, God welcomes us with open arms. Listen, as long as you're clinging to your sin and that sin has not been washed away, it stands in between you and God. And I believe that in the heart of every person, there is a God-shaped hole that only His love can fill. People try to fill it with every other thing. We try to fill it with mindless entertainment or we try to fill it with uh, money or power or sex our relationships, people are trying to fill that hole that God alone can fill. That hole can never be filled. That need can never be met until you come to God through Jesus Christ. And as his blood washes that sin away, God welcomes you in. So that's, that's number one of six. That's pretty good, right? Here's another one. The apostles preach the truth. Uh, look in verse 14. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain. Our faith is in vain. In verse 15, we're even be found, we are even to be found misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ. Look, he's saying, look, if, if Christ has not been raised, he's saying we apostles were a bunch of liars. We've been, we're, we're bearing false witness to what God has done. But since Christ has been raised... You can trust the word of the apostles. They're telling the truth. And I'll be honest, th this is a big truth to swallow. Because people don't just rise from the dead every day, right? 
I've never seen it. In my experience, I've never seen it. Those people in that time, they hadn't seen it unless they'd hung around Jesus a little bit for Lazarus and the, a few others there. But in our experience, it hasn't happened. It is definitely an anomaly. But it's true. God raised Jesus from the dead, and the, the apostles bore witness to that. So they spoke the truth, an astounding truth, a hard-to-believe truth, but the most powerful truth that, that can affect everybody. They spoke the truth. And go to verse 19. We'll, we'll jump ahead. Not only did they pre, uh, speak the truth, their preaching was not in vain. Look at verse 19. If in Christ we have hope in this whole... Oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to go there yet. Let's, let's stay in 14 there. Our preaching is in vain. Look, their preaching was not in vain. Something that is in vain is powerless. It's worthless. It's empty. There's nothing in it of value. But because Jesus rose from the dead, their preaching was powerful. Their preaching mattered. Their preaching had the power to save people. So... Uh, we can trust in that, and we can follow through with that on our own today. Since their preaching was not in vain, if we preach the same word that they preached, it will have the same kind of power. Because we, we operate by the same word, we operate by the same spirit. Proclaiming Jesus Christ as Savior is as powerful today as it was back then. But listen, people want to discredit the apostles. Uh, even back in those times... As soon as, as they got word that Jesus rose from the dead, they wanted to discredit it. They started spreading lies. That, that was just what they did. Uh, they started trying to say the apostles were lying about what they were saying. There's a guy, this, this guy right here, Chuck Colson. He was one of the Watergate Seven, meaning he was one of President Richard Nixon's inside guys who knew about the shenanigans that had gone on with Watergate. And he maintains that that experience with Watergate proves to him that the apostles were telling the truth about Jesus resurrected from the dead. Here's what he said. I'm going to read his statement to you. If I can find it. And I can't find Oh, yeah, I got it. Papers get all mixed up here. Gene, I may need you to help me up. Oh, I got it. Okay. Here, here's what he says. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, the historical fact of Jesus Christ's resurrection is the only basis of our hope. Without the resurrection, our faith is futile. That's why critics of Christianity try, Christianity try to explain away the empty tomb. They claim that the disciples lied, that they stole Jesus' body themselves and conspired together to pretend that he had risen. The apostles then somehow managed to recruit more than 500 other people to lie for them as well. To say that they saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. How plausible is that theory? That the apostles made it all up and perpetuated a hoax. Here's what he says. Fast forward nearly 2,000 years to an event I know a lot about, Watergate. Before all the facts about Watergate were known to the public in March of 1973, it was becoming clear to Nixon's closest aides that someone had tried to cover up the Watergate break-in. He said there were no more than a dozen of us, and he was one of them. This guy was one of them. Could we maintain a cover-up to save the president? He said we were all political zealots. We were all sold out uh, in believing in our candidate and our party. We enjoyed enormous political power and prestige. With all that at stake, you'd expect us to be capable of maintaining a lie to protect the president. Does that make sense? He's saying a dozen people knew about the Watergate break-in. We were some of the most powerful people in the nation. We had prestige. We had influence. He said, you'd think a dozen people could keep that under wraps. And he says, we just couldn't do it. The first guy to crack was John Dean. He told everything. And then he turned state's witness. Uh, and then he said, as soon as that domino fell, every one of them started turning over and turning over. He said, it was within a couple weeks that they started cracking. Some of the most powerful men in the nation could not maintain a hoax and a cover-up and a lie. And he looks back and says, if we couldn't do it, how in the world could those, those apostles maintain a lie in the face of persecution and suffering and imprisonment 
and in death. Most of them were executed, killed, murdered. He's saying they're not going to die for a lie. He said if, if these powerful men couldn't cover it up, there's no way those 12 apostles could maintain that hoax. He says it's true. It's true what they said was true. Because what the apostles said was true, your faith is well-founded. Look in verse 15. <clears throat> Sorry, 14. Our preaching, he said, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. He's saying your faith is for nothing if Jesus died and stayed dead like any other person. It's for nothing. But since Jesus has been raised, since you can trust that the apostles were proclaiming the truth, since you can trust their eyewitness of Jesus walking around, then your faith is built on a solid rock. And if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, it can be put in no better spot. Your faith is in the right place, Christian. If you trust that not only that Jesus was raised, but you place your trust in Jesus himself, you're going to be okay. No matter what the world throws at you, you're going to be okay because you are held up by God. Look, one need of our, our hearts not only is to be accepted by God, but every one of us needs someone we can count on. Absolutely. And we all have relationships with people that we count on, uh, that we trust in, that we know are there for us and sincerely love us and are looking out for our best. But if you're placing your faith in Jesus, you have somebody who will never, ever leave you, who will never, ever forsake you. Not just somebody, but the Son of God who stands at the right hand of God and intercedes with you before the Creator Himself that's someone who loves you enough to die for you. If your faith is in him and you build your life on him, then you have a life that will never be shaken. Though the world may fall apart, if you're clinging to Christ, you're safe. You're safe and sound. Keep your faith in him. Here's, a, here's, a, here's the next one. We are to be envied. Uh, in Verse 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Here's what he's saying. If Jesus never rose from the dead, and he's saying we apostles and, and, and people that were living for him, who are pouring our lives out for him, if he never rose, then the whole world should pity us because we're wasting our lives. Everything we're doing counts for naught. We're suffering for no payoff, nothing. We should be pitied. We should be looked down on, maybe even scorned. But if you flip that, since Jesus did rise from the dead, if people knew the truth, then Christians, you shouldn't be pitied. You should be envied. Because in Jesus Christ, you find wealth that you will find nowhere else. In Jesus Christ, you find value that you will find nowhere else. And you have something waiting on you that is worth everything you go through down here. Uh, this is 2 Corinthians 4, 17. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And that's the Apostle Paul talking. That is a man who was beaten for his faith, who was stoned for his faith, who shepherd, suffered sick, uh, shipwrecks and floggings and imprisonment. And he calls those light and momentary troubles. Something that happens and is quickly forgotten. Here's how he can say that. Because one day he knew that he would rise from the dead. And that the riches of God would be lavished on him. He knew that what was waiting for him was worth the price he paid. Guys, let me tell you. No matter what you go through on this earth. When you cling to Christ and you don't let him go, no matter what you suffer here, one day you will look back and say, worth it. Right? Absolutely. Whatever you suffer here, it is worth it. No matter what job you lose for the sake of Christ, no matter what relationships you lose for Christ's sake, uh, if you do face persecution, if 
if you have to endure the things that Paul did, and there are brothers and sisters right now in our world who are enduring that kind of persecution, and it is worth it. It's not something uh, that they're suffering for nothing. The payoff is worth way more than the investment. So the lesson for that is, don't let go. Never, never, never give up, no matter what you're facing. No, no matter what uh, pressures you're facing, don't let go of Jesus. Your faith is in vain. It's built on a solid rock, and what's coming is greater than you uh, are going through. Uh, he ends the chapter by saying this, Therefore, my brothers and si- or dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Payoff is waiting. And it it will be greater than I think any of us can currently comprehend. Keep, stay the course. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Glory awaits. Here's the last one. Look at verse 18. If Jesus has not been raised, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. <coughs> Excuse me. What he's saying there is this. They're done. You'll never see him again. If Christ was not raised, then death is just death and that's it. Period. Stop. Nothing else. But since Jesus Christ has been raised... You can have faith and trust that that your loved ones who died in Christ will live again. It's not the end. In fact, they're alive now. Waiting waiting for Jesus to come back and gather us all. Uh, Take heart that your loved ones in Christ, if you are faithful to Christ, you'll see them again. And reap that eternal glory with him. Uh, in, in the Father's mansions, there are many rooms. Some of those rooms, it seems like, are filling up, depending on how, how old you get and the more people you love that you lose that pass on. But there's room enough for you, too. Death is not the end. The grave is not the goal. God will raise us up on that last day. So, the tomb is empty. Your life has been powerfully affected by that. It will be as affected by it as you allow it to be. The tomb is empty. Glory awaits. Life eternal is gifted to us along with all these other gifts. My question to you this morning is what are you going to do about it this week? How is Jesus' resurrection going to impact the way you operate? How you, how you deal with people at work? How you deal with stresses at work or at school? How is this risen Jesus going to affect the way you uh, treat people? How's it going to affect the way you approach money and, and relationships? Because all of that should change. Because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross and what God did for us by raising him up from the dead. If anybody has any need, please come forward while we stand and sing.